Today is January 26th, 2015. My name is Teresa Beer Larson, and joining me is Stuart Buck. Pleasure to be here. I'm glad you're here with us, Stuart. <laughs> um, I'm going to call you Stu because um, we should be forthcoming. I've known you for a long time, Indeed. and so I'll, I'll be more familiar. Um, do I have your permission to record your face and your voice today? You do, yes. Great. The Ames Historical Society has long been interested in trains and how they influence Ames. You as well have <laughs> long been interested in trains and how they influence Ames. Tell me, first of all, when and where you were born. Okay. Born in Ames, Iowa, Mary Greeley Hospital, October 17th, 1951. And your father, um, what was his profession in Ames? He was a dentist. And your mother? She was a teacher at Iowa State in clothing and textile design. You were probably, you came home from the hospital, your mom and dad brought you home from the hospital, and they tell you stories about how you responded to trains. Can you tell me about that? Well, it is interesting because it goes back to my earliest childhood memories. My parents would put me to bed at night and in kind of that environment of, of the deep cobalt blue of twilight, I, I became just interested in the sounds in the night. There was this whole ocean of sound outside my bedroom window and it, it formed a, an audio tapestry area, a symphony of sound, if you want to call that. But we lived on Woodland Street, right across from where uh, Edwards Elementary School was, and which was only a couple blocks away from Lincoln Highway, which at the time was Highway 30, the main drag through town. And part of what I would hear as I was going to sleep were the trucks that would come into town. There was a substantial amount of traffic on that, and the first a stoplight would have been at Franklin and Lincoln Way. So as the trucks would come into town and get caught by the red light, I could hear this <laughs> as they're downshifting, coming to a stop, and you could hear this hydraulic hiss and release of the brakes as they would take off. And also, our location of our house was about, well, less than a mile from Iowa State University. So just kind of keeping a constant in my life as I was going to sleep, part of the sounds was the the campanile with the bells every quarter of the hour chiming away. And just little things I'd pick up on like the night hawk. We live right next to the woods and you get these crickets and the frogs just chirping away. But those were all kind of the prelude or the overture to the main symphony at least for me. And that was this amazing sound and keep in mind as you just mentioned this is when I'm a baby long before I knew that th this was a truck or a night hawk or any of these sounds they just intrigued me but one in particular just was so filled with emotion that it, it was melodious it seemed to be adventuresome it also seemed kind of lonesome but whatever that was as a, as a little kid I just my ear would just gravitate to that, and that was the sound of the steam locomotive whistle, which would have been on the Chicago and Northwestern main line that was just to the north of our house about a, a mile away. So that's how early on, and I mean, even to the point that my parents' friends remarked, there's something about this kid, what's the deal here? He, he's picking up on this train long before what he knows what it is, it must be, in, they jokingly said it must be in his DNA that he has this interest in trains, but it goes that far back that, that there was a reaction. Now the reality is my dad liked trains and he passed that passion on to me. And, and like a fireman shoveling coal to build up steam, he, w he did that with my enthusiasm. There's no question it was because of him that my interest in trains got going. So tell me a little bit more about your youth and what kind of experiences you had with trains in Ames. I'm, I'm asking an open-ended question so you can start wherever <laughs> well, you'd like. Well, the first thing, again, to, to fuel that fire, one of our favorite things to do, he would take the three boys down to the Ames Depot. And there was a train that came in at 217. It was called the Challenger. That train was initiated or inaugurated in 1953 and there's a window of time that that came through at that specific time period 
And what's significant, I guess, is as far as the family. We're talking about young kids. Most of the, the trains that came through Ames, and at this time there was at least 20 trains going eastbound, westbound, going through Ames. Most of them came through in a fleet that left Chicago about 5 o'clock. And that fleet was the city of Denver, the city of San Francisco, the city of Los Angeles, the city of Portland. They all left about a half hour after each other, starting about 5 o'clock. That put those trains into Ames about 10 o'clock and after. So for a young child, that didn't work out real well. The fleet came eastbound then, trying to time their schedules to arrive in Chicago mid-morning. So those trains would have come through Ames starting about 4 o'clock and arriving mid-morning mid in Chicago. So this train had the perfect schedule, I guess, for a family in that it was in the afternoon, and our Sunday meal was, our big meal was in, at 12.30, and so we'd finish the meal, and Dad would tell the boys to hop in the car, and we'd head down to the Ames Depot. And it was great for everyone, because Dad liked trains, I liked trains, my brothers liked, you didn't have to be a rail fan to be intrigued by the Ames Depot. There was just always something going on. And the first thing that we do is we would go down into what the railroad called the subway. Most people would call it a pedestrian underpass, but it was a, a stair, staircase that took you down and onto the other platform. But that was entertaining in itself because it was like this echo chamber, and as the boys would get out, we were just all pumped up. And I remember we'd just stomp our feet and, and, and make noise to get this echo in there. And then you'd go up the stairs, and, and what you'd be on would be the westbound platform. And just a little information there. The, it, Northwestern was unique in that it ran its trains on the left-hand side. So by going underneath, you're now on the south track, which would be for the westbound trains. Mm -hmm. But there are several reasons why we did this, because the Challenger was a westbound train. We wanted to be closer to the train when it came in. But once you got up on the platform, it gave you a commanding view of downtown and the, and the railroad yards. From the depot, it was on a curve, the depot still is, but I mean, from the depot itself, you, you couldn't see quite so well looking east or west. Once you got onto that depot platform, you could see straight down the tracks to the, to the east and see the tracks going to the west. So it gave you an advantage of kind of this platform, and it was also a contained space for my, for my dad that we couldn't go too far. It was designated in this concrete platform. But it also gave you this view of the, the downtown yards. And this is something I think a lot of people in Ames have forgotten about, that until the 1960s, there was a substantial yard of at least a dozen tracks downtown, which also meant not only you had all those tracks, but you had trains at all times of the day being made up. Uh, so for a, a, a kid to get up here, and you have all this activity of the switching going on, and at that time, it was the last of the steam locomotives in Ames. So we're watching these little steam engines puffing back and forth and just all this activity. Remember, one in particular, it was a string of cars that was being switched. And uh, Ames used to have stockyards on the south side of the tracks there, east of the depot. And the, the switcher had picked up this and was making up a train. But the, these stock cars went by, and here's... Here's three boys with cattle and hogs, the little snout sticking out and oinking away and kind of getting the odor from, from the cattle. It was like, whoa, this is, this is amazing. It, it didn't strike us where they were going. They were headed to the south side of Chicago. But as a kid, that was fascinating. And I also remember in the same string of cars was a flat car with a brand new John Deere tractor on it. And it, it was so new, you could actually kind of smell the toxic the, of the paint and, and the smell of the, the rubber tires. But those things just fascinated us as kids, just to always have something going on. But also, Dad would like to entertain us with regaling us about the great trains. And he talked about trains like the Pacific Limited, the, the San Francisco Overland, the Los Angeles Limited, the Treasure Island Special, the 49er, the National Park Special, the Colorado Columbine, the uh, Rocky Mountain Bluebird, the Portland Rose, the Corn King Limited. These are all just amazing, famous, renowned trains that, that came through Ames. They, they were really its lifeblood, its pulse. 
And it was just so fun hearing his enthusiasm talking about the golden days and what it was like. And if, if I can, there were several stories that he liked to tell. One of them was of a relative picking up a relative at the Ames Depot on Christmas Eve during a blizzard. And this was an eastbound train, so they stood kind of at the west end of the Ames platform. There's this amazing amount of snow coming down. He's, he's hearing the train as it's coming down the, 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 the uh, hill near the, near the college, but you can't see a thing with this thick curtain of, of snow. And the sound kept getting louder and louder, but the snow was just covering up everything. Then he talked about how the headlight now started kind of glowing and it got brighter and brighter and the, the sound got louder and louder. Then all of a sudden, the train just came blasting out of this curtain and he watched the, the rod, the driving rods on these six foot high driving wheels flash by the flickering of the, the fire in the firebox, the, the, the uh, fireman leaning out trying to guide the engineer into the station. Keep in mind, t time was of essence to the railroads at this time. So they didn't just limp into the station. They came in at 45 miles an hour or faster. Now they're starting to slow down. The engineer's putting the brakes on. You have brake shoes going up against steel wheels. Sparks are, are flying out. You've got that acrid smell of, of that friction. You've got this blue-gray smoke coming off the wheels. The train's flashing by, starting to slow down. You've got the coach cars going by. All of a sudden, here comes the dining cars. It's starting to slow down, and you're looking in the side, and here are people sitting down for a Christmas meal with fresh-cut flowers. The train continues on, and it comes to a stop with the, the end car of the observation car. And on the back, you had the what were called the marker lights, the red lights on the back, just glowing in the snow, and then proudly proclaiming the name of the train was what was called a drumhead or a round uh, sign on the back that was lit, San Francisco Overland. And that was hanging on the back uh, veranda or porch that they had back there that was all polished brass. And Dad would just talk about, imagine what it would be like to be in this train. It's Christmas Eve, and everyone on the train is going home to be with friends and family. So you have this camaraderie of what, what it's like to, to experience this, this Christmas. And here you're on a train where you can sit down to a specially prepared meal. What I mean special, it was made for a Christmas Eve. So, so you have turkey and ham served on linen tablecloth with china that was designed with a specific design for the, that train, San mm -hmm. Francisco Overland. Again, fresh cut flowers, you sit down to a wonderful meal. After dinner, you could retire to the lounge car, perhaps uh, visit the bartender for a little nip, perhaps, of uh, Christmas spirit, and then head back to the, the uh, observation car where they had these big stuffed chairs. It, it was a time of travel that just... I can it, tell uh, that your it, dad <laughs> created this w wonderful well, it image and My for wife you. and I just went out to, to uh, Colorado uh, a month ago, and we flew out there. We got out there very efficiently, but somehow the elegance and, and it, the amazement of travel it got you there, but it didn't get you there in the style mm -hmm. that, that was experienced on, on this train. It was just an amazing time. I can see how your dad has fueled this. And so as a very young person, you're responding to sounds, and he's telling you stories, and you and your brothers go down to the train station. So are you independently thinking about trains aside from your father? I mean, are you um, involved with looking things up, or are you following images of the trains yourself? Well, absolutely. Okay. I mean, from the, from the very beginning, and there's a, a strong connection with art mm -hmm. that from my mom and trains from my dad, that that early on became a thing. My dad su subscribed me to Trains Magazine, I have trains magazines that go back to 1951, all in binders in my studio. But that that fascination just, yes, he lit the fire and mm -hmm. it took off. 
And there was a train illustration in Ames I think you might have looked at. Well, there's a couple. There's one <laughs> right above my shoulder here, which is at the uh, Sheldon Munn Hotel. And early on, it just resonated with me because it was incorporating art and trains. And there used to be a little thing that I, I would do in the summertime, maybe a couple times a month, and that was to go down to the hobby shop. But to get down there, I had a little routine, and I would head down to Frank, the corner of Franklin and Woodland Street. First thing, I'd ask my mom if she had any mail to go out, because there's a mailbox there at the, at the uh, corner. So I'd go down there and put the mail in the mailbox. This is big-time stuff, because I'm by myself, didn't have my parents. And I'd wait for the Crosstown bus, which would come up Woodland Avenue and turn going south on Franklin. Hop on that, head downtown. I get off of what was the Rainbow Cafe, which would have been Kitty Corner to the police station at the time on Fifth and Kellogg, and I would now start to walk towards the the hobby shop. But in doing so, I would go by the Sheldon. Well, I'd go by the bank first, and then go by the Sheldon Mun. But I'd always kind of arc and go to the west and go into that lobby so that I could see that mural. I just thought that mural was so cool because it was my town of Ames, and there was the train in that. But then after, that was just my little thing, touching base with that, I'd, I'd maybe stop at Eschbach Music House and then head down Main Street to the hobby shop. And again, this interest, it was already fueled with me, but going to the hobby shop, which had boxes upon boxes of little models and things, I, I had an in with the proprietor, Mr. Noyd, who recognized that there was interest here in trains and would let me go behind the counter and up to the ceiling where these boxes full of models. And so I would go through these models and if a train came, I had the VIP gold pass which allowed me to go out the back door, which there's like a little patio, it's probably a loading dock or whatever, which I could watch the trains there. And what's maybe noteworthy about that was at that time, again, the railroad yards were in downtown uh, Ames. The main line was moved further away from from the from Main Street when they took those yards out of downtown. So when you stepped out on the back of the hobby shop, there was a alleyway there, maybe ten feet, and then the main line was just right there. So I mean, when when you stepped out there, you had this platform, viewing platform, to watch the train go by. So that, that was a pretty cool deal. But the idea was, I would find a model. Then I would walk to where my, I mentioned my dad was a dentist, but his dental office was just to the north of the depot on 5th, 5th Street. And I would enter through the back door because that was the, um, where my Uncle Ben worked as a technician making crowns and dentures and that type of stuff. And, and he would always welcome me in and there was a place where I could then put my model together. And then when my dad was done with work, I could head back with him. But that incorporates the artwork. And maybe there's another one that I love, which was in the mid-50s, there was a movie put out called The, Lo the Great Locomotive Chase. And, and uh, it starred Fess Parker, who was my idol, because he was at that time on the, on the Disney show uh, Davy Crockett. And I had to have my coonskin hat and all that stuff. But he also starred in this movie, which was at the Collegiate Theater which that in itself was great. It was a story, a true story about a uh, civil war of, of hijacking, I guess, a train, which then uh, a chase ensued on that, thus the name, the Great Locomotive Chase. But the thing that really stuck with me was prior to the movie, they, had, they always would have movie posters out, outside, underneath the marquee, and seeing that movie poster and appreciating that artwork and realizing then after I saw the movie how that encapsulated the whole experience into a work of art that was that really intrigued me that that this artist has found a way of crystallizing an experience we've talked about looking at trains we've talked a look touching base a little bit about art of trains what about actually writing on trains Surely, with your father's interest, you took a few train rides or two. We did. Or seven. <laughs> or a million. <laughs> First no, about one, steam. One thing I, I yeah. should point out yeah. is a, an important date to Ames, and that was October 30th, 1955, which I think kind of came without people really knowing, 
But I told you about all those trains. I listed them and how they just came through Ames one after the other, like streetcars. On October 30th, 1955, the Union Pacific Railroad, which ran, the, the Northwestern collaborated with trains. The, the Northwestern would run them between Chicago and Omaha. The Union Pacific would then take them out to the coast, where I'm talking about the, the Portland Rose. I mean, that train ran through Ames on the Northwestern, changed over the Union Pacific, and then went out to Portland. The Union Pacific decided that they didn't like the Northwestern. They, they Northwestern kind of had the foresight that, that passenger service is on the way out. Union Pacific still had that desire to keep the passenger train, and they decided to take their passenger service and put it on the Milwaukee Road, which would have gone through, like, uh, Maxwell and Cambridge and Huxley and Slater and, and on to Perry. But in doing so, the service went from some 20 passenger trains a day to essentially four passenger trains a day, and then that diminished very quickly to, by 1960, the last passenger train came through Ames. So when you ask about riding trains through Ames, that was somewhat limited. We did take a lot of big-time passenger trains, not out of Ames, but uh, to keep this kind of Ames related, there were several trips, one of which we did, like once a month is a kind of a neat thing to do, would be ride the train over to Marshalltown, and then you could get off and ride the train back. But on the, on the ride back, we would go to the dining car and have dinner, which was a pretty neat deal, because it was a great dinner, and it was an unusual way to have dinner. But I guess the one that left the impression on me was a trip into Chicago, which must have been about 1955. Again, this is prior to the train being taken off. Um, but going into Chicago, and this kind of brings up another subject, as we got to the outskirts of Chicago, I remember seeing lines and lines of, of steam locomotives that were just waiting to be scrapped. Because that's another big date that aims people in history 1954 would have been the last date for a steam train through Ames. So the railroads were changing radically at that time, and, and Ames was reflecting that. They were a little on the, 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 the quick edge as far as losing their passenger service because most towns would have kept it up until Amtrak came in 1971. So we took a lot of tra train trips like on the Empire Builder, the California Zephyr, the Southern Pacific Daylight. We did ride lots, lots of trains, but as far as right out of Ames, it, it was kind of slim after <laughs> 1955. So, I mean, I'm four years old when that happened. Mm -hmm. um, the curriculum in the Ames schools, I know this, and you probably yes. know, had transportation units. <laughs> and I think we might have been in different schools, but I did get to ride the train to Boone. Did you get to do Everybody that? Everybody got that as part of the curriculum, and indeed, I do remember that. We drove over to Boone, caught the train. The thing that, I guess there's a couple things I remember. One of which was when we started, it, it started just so smoothly. It was like it, almost imperceptible. I thought there would be some movement or whatever, but I just remember it just smoothly left the station uh, as the tracks leave Boone, they parallel uh, what used to be Highway 30, mm -hmm. and my mom was one of the persons that, that caravaned over to Boone with some of the school kids, and now she's driving on that parallel road, and we're all waving at her along that. And I also remember that, uh, that we got to go into the dining car, and all the dining car attendants had these white uniforms on with, with a white, it was kind of a paper hat, but the, one of the attendants found out how interested I, I was and gave me his white hat, which, man, I was a wheel because I had that. And I still have that, by the way. <laughs> uh, in addition to um, taking that, that passenger train experience from Ames to Boone and, and back, um, there were other train lines that serviced Ames. Um, I'm thinking of the interurban. And um, in other words, there weren't just the main east-west right. 
mm -hmm. um, kinds of things. Did you have some experiences with that? I, I did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> there was the Fort Dodge Des Moines Southern. So just a little history. Back in the 1890s, people started talking about we need some something to connect the city with Iowa State Agriculture College mm -hmm. at the time. And so they established uh, on July 4th, 1891, a, a little train that was called the Dinky that ran between town and, and the college. That ran until 1907. In 1907, that line was bought by the Fort Dodge Des Moines Southern, and kind of one of the things that was uh, common at that time is to electrify or make that an electric service, which meant that they would put wires up and, you'd, like, like a trolley, you'd have a pole going up picking up the uh, electricity. And that ran from 1907 passenger service until the mid-50s. In the mid-50s, the Fort Dodge line had a, well, there was a huge flood in the Des Moines River Valley, and they had their power plant north of Boone in the little town of Frazier. That got flooded, and at that point, that pretty much put them out of the electrification business. They tried to bring it back, but realized that at this point, passenger service is kind of going out, the electrical thing is hard to operate, and so they continued doing freight with diesels, but they stopped their passenger service, which would be on the entire line, but that also included into Ames. And my dad realized that this was an opportunity to ride the last interurban car, so he got um, me down to the, the station, which was where I think the credit union it is Credit Union is today. We, we knew it in high school as a King's Food Host, but it would be to the west of the, the Northwestern Station. But they used to have a depot there, and he got us down. It was a hot September day, and I was excited to ride this experience, and man, I just couldn't wait to get on. And, and finally, we got the, the car came in, and we, we get on, get, got great seats, sit down, I look at my feet. I don't have any shoes. <laughs> where are my shoes? So everyone's getting on the car, and I'm. My dad's going, Stu, where are your shoes? I don't know, Dad. <laughs> so we we got to do something. So we're afraid we're going to lose our seat. But we get up, and we're like salmon going upstream, <laughs> trying to go through all the people who are coming in. And finally, we got to the end of the car, looked down through the vestibule steps, and stuck in the tar down below were my red ball jets. And it was such a hot day, and what had happened is the depot platform had cracked, and they'd put tar in there just to fix the crack. Well, it had got so hot that that tar was kind of bubbling up, and I was so excited, I didn't even notice until we got on the train that, that my shoes were off, so I went pulled the shoes out. But the, it was such a fun trip, because I remember by that time, the maintenance on the track wasn't maybe at, at the best, so the Everything had kind of grown up next to the track, and as a kid, it was just fun kind of whacking the trees and stuff as we went by. But the train went out through campus by the power plant, the, the, the uh, campus power plant, cut diagonally down by Memorial Union, and came right through Campus Town or Dogtown uh, near the these towers. They weren't, they weren't there at the time, but then were the old country club, and then it headed up to Kelly. And that's where the line met the main line that would go from Fort Dodge to Boone, through Kelly to Ankeny, and down to Des Moines. So that's where the car turned around and then brought us back. And it was the last interurban inter car in Ames. I think there's still a building that's odd shaped down in Campus Town as there a result is. of that diagonal. Very perceptive when you go down there, it's diagonal, yes, and indeed. I'm going to struggle a little bit on the address, but I... I'm going to struggle a little bit, too, but it's, yeah, it's just, tucked back there, back and it's uh -huh. very obvious when you look at it, you say, well, why would that building be at that odd, odd angle? angle? It's because... The train went yeah. right, right And just a there. quick story about that, because mm -hmm. it comes up through Campus Town, okay, mm -hmm. uh, crossed over Lincoln Highway right uh -huh. by the Union, and then there was a grade that took it up mm -hmm. to... A little higher lands there as it went by again where the towers mm -hmm. okay um, one of the things the college students used to like to do was of course they would imbibe a little in the uh, the taverns there in, in <laughs> campus town but they thought this was this is pretty clever they'd go down and put grease on the tracks 
okay? And freight service, for the most part, into Ames was at night. The passenger trains would come in during the day, and then freight service would be at night, which would be the time they'd be in the bar. So they'd go and put some grease on the tracks, and when the trains tried to get up the hill, they can't get any traction, and... The, the college students got their yucks, but I can tell you, I remember talking to the crews. They didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the story of having some alcohol on trains is coming to me. I think uh, there are there places they could put kegs out. and. Uh, well, you know, that is funny. <laughs> there is a story that has to do with the dinky. Yeah. That, again, this would be the early 1900s. And um, there's a story that there are some enterprising college students that would ride the dinky down to Ames. Its station used to be down at the end of Main Street, okay, which would allow them easy access to the bars down there. They had this little enterprise of waiting until the train would depart they would sneak on to say have what they call open vestibules. It would be like a platform that would be on the end of each car. And they wait to that last car, hop on the back platform with a keg. They would get to Iowa State University or college or at the time <laughs> Iowa Agriculture College, but they would get there. The train would go around what's called a balloon track or it would turn around to get it pointed back to Ames and when it went in that direction near what would be Marsden Hall, there was a, a bunch of bushes right there. They'd roll the keg off into the bushes. The train would then return to the station. They would nonchalantly walk their way over to the, the bushes. They'd have their keg. Well, they did this several times. Everything was just cool. Boy, they got this thing going. But one time, they go down there, get their keg, roll into the bushes. They come to recover their keg. And there was somebody waiting there for them. It was President Beardshear. <laughs> and he caught those culprits. <laughs> it's a great story. It's a great story. They put well, an end to their little business. <laughs> Are there any other stories that you would like to tell me about steam engines coming through Ames in your youth or you riding trains that has to do with your own particular personal experience in Ames before we move on to your adult life and your connection. I would like to tell a story. This good. does not personal. This is another one of my dad's stories. That's okay. I think it's a good one. Um, but he talked about the first regularly scheduled diesel train that came through Ames. It was the city of Denver. And this was unusual that everything up to that point had been steam. And we were in a depression at that time. And technology was, it's not like the diesel was just invented in the 30s. It had been around, but it just hadn't really got any gravity. But as the 30s came around, the technology got to the point where a diesel was starting to make sense. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you had the depression, which was the ridership on trains was, had, had dropped in that time. And railroads were looking for a way to entice people back to the rails. And one of the ways of doing that, to come up with something that captured their imagination that was just different than what they're used to. And so they came up with these dieselized streamliners that were very lightweight, high speed. And that was something that just left a huge impression on him. Again, these trains would have left Chicago and get, would be getting in about 10 o'clock at night. And so his experience of actually watching it, because he's a young kid at the time, this would be 1936, but he lived at, on Oakland Street. So the railroad main line would have been less than a mile to the north of, of where he lived. He talked about how he could hear the train leaving, and it was obvious that it was a diesel because it didn't have a steam whistle, it had an air horn. And it was a single, he, he described it as a blatting sound, which was not melodious like the steam whistles, but it was very obvious that the train was leaving town. He could not actually see the train, but he could see something that they had on the train. They had not only the headlight, as all trains did, but they had something to warn motorists. 
They had a fast moving train. It wasn't like a steam locomotive belching smoke up into the sky. They were concerned that motorists would not be able to see this train. So they not only had a beam going straight out, they had a beam going up into the air, just this pillar of light going up. But my dad would stay up at night listening to noises, much like his son later on, but he would hear that blathing sound and know, okay, the city of Denver's heading west. Okay, now he could, from his home in Oakland, look to the north and follow that pillar of light as it's working its way towards Boone. And he was their house was directly to the to the south of the Minnesota what's now known as the Minnesota Avenue overpass. Mm -hmm. But he always liked to tell the story about how that beam of light when the train went under the, the overpass, it would just be snuffed out temporarily, and he knew exactly where the train was as it worked its way west. Just, a, just another quick thing about the city of Denver and what that meant to Ames. Mm -hmm. At that time, the city of Denver was the fastest long-distance train in the world. It covered the, uh, the uh, Chicago to Denver in 16 hours. That's an average of close to 70 miles an hour. Keeping in mind, that's a train that's stopping at various stops along the way. It, it's extraordinary, and we're talking about 1936. Just let me give you an example again to, to tell you what the service was like at that time. The city of Denver coming through Ames heading east, and this is something my dad and his parents took advantage of because you could get into Chicago so efficiently. It came through about 4.30 in the morning, okay? In exactly four hours and 52 minutes, you were in downtown Chicago. We're not talking about an O'Hare an hour out. You were in downtown Chicago within, I mean, quick walking distance of Lake Michigan of the whole loop down there. When, when you try to think about that, in that time compared to today, if you're going to go to Chicago, most people, if they're going to fly, you've got to drive down to Des Moines, that's an hour. Check in an hour or two early. Of course, your flight there is going to be a half hour, 45 minutes, but that leaves you out in O'Hare. You've got to get into downtown Chicago. I don't think you can do it faster in four hours and <laughs> I don't 52 think so minutes. Either. <laughs> and you could do it in 1936 very efficiently. And I know my dad's family quite often took advantage of that because you could go in, and I think sometimes they even went in, they would arrive mid morning shop or do whatever the day and then catch the fleet going out. Like I said, it, it, it starting at 5 o'clock, you had 5, 5.30, 6, 6. You mm -hmm. could catch any of those trains and be back before midnight. So, I mean, talk about convenience. Not have to drive to the morning. You just have to drive down to, to the Ames Depot. Another reason to uh, be in love with trains. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and speaking of that, you express that now. Um, in many different ways, but of course through your artwork. Talk to me a little bit about, um, of course you had a profession um, in education, yes. and you, you taught art, but at some point you must have wanted to put this passion on paper. Well, it, that idea came very early, like I said, I mean, with response to the artwork, and by the, the second I could start holding a pencil, I had that interest. I guess from the standpoint of kind of kicking it up a notch. I graduated from Iowa State in 1975, and that's when you mentioned the fact that I was a teacher. I got my job teaching um, high school art classes. But I also felt like an obligation, I guess, as a teacher to be active in what it is I teach. And I just thought, what am I interested in? I'm interested in trains. I, I Particularly at Iowa State, I kind of put the, the train thing I pushed it down a little bit, I guess. I didn't consider that a, a subject maybe to use. But after, after graduating, I thought, what the heck? It's what I like to do. I, I think I'm just going to start a business, a freelance business. had no idea where, where it would take me, but I just thought, let's take those interests and couple them together and see where it takes me. And the name of your business is? Streamliner Studio. <laughs> let's start with... Um I'm not sure which of your works that you've done about Ames you'd like to talk about first. Well, the ones I did for the city, I think, again, from one. a historical standpoint, yeah. there are three pieces I did. One 
was to portray just kind of the golden age of the Ames Depot, and I've alluded to the fact that it was just the portal for Ames. It was so. What I wanted to show is this two steam locomotives meeting with the depot in the background. I just thought that was so important. Uh, the depot built in 1900. I think part of what people kind of forget in 19, 1950s, the whole area north of the depot was converted into a parking lot. Okay, but up until that time, those were elaborate gardens that were uh, managed by an Iowa State. Um, botany professor, mm -hmm. and there was places to wander through this elaborate garden. One of the things, they'd grow the flowers as a train would come to a stop and you'd look out the window, it, it spelled out Ames. But it was just a beautiful depot, a, just a pride of our town. It just seemed like if I'm doing these for the city of Ames, it would make sense to have the steam locomotives and to have the depot there. And the name of that piece is? I think it's the Golden Age of Steam. I, okay, I think the right. can't, okay. can't remember. Yeah. The the next one is, I think, entitled Switch Dan. Mm -hmm. But to go back in history, I just find it intriguing that, that Iowa State Agriculture College, I believe, came like in 1858 or around that time. It Ames was not a town. I mean, I think some people think that Ames was here and then the college came. It was, the college was established long before, years before Ames really became established. And, and it was the railroad builder, John Blair. He brought out Oaks Ames. They, they rode the train as far as Marshalltown. That's as far as the tracks came and rode the stagecoach looking for the route to take the, the, the tracks on to Council Bluffs. And essentially, they kind of plotted out where they're headed. The ne next year, John B Blair came through really looking for the most efficient place to cross over the Skunk River. N there was not, there were people settled in the Ames area, but there wasn't Ames. And when he established that crossing, he named Ames after his friend, but Ames wasn't really a town at that point. It was a name. It was once the train came through, and he established, again, because of the river system and the way it could cross over, and the fact that railroads like to have station stops about every five or seven to ten miles. And it made sense. Here's a place. There's a college right there. This seems like a good place to locate. Okay, what's that have to do with my artwork? <laughs> the, the first thing, when, when that is established, and now Ames is going to start to coagulate into a, a town, and, and that's starting to happen. The first thing that would have happened to the railroad is we need to establish a switch track or a siding to bring construction materials. So I guess that was kind of symbolic to me. The switch stand kind of represents kind of the first development of Ames. Mm -hmm. And then the next one was called the junction, which I thought was important because... That really established Ames. First thing, the fact that they had the railroad coming through that, that was great, and it was connected to what would become the Transcontinental Railroad. That was very much to Ames' benefit. But then when it became the crossroads, that really put Ames on the map, so to speak. And, and just an interesting little thing about the, the, cro the crossing there. At one time, that was a separate railroad, it was, it was the Des Moines and Minnesota Railroad. It was a narrow gauge railroad, which is unusual that, it, that its gauge was three feet instead of the standard four foot, eight and a half inches. And it came through. Uh, Ames essentially is, is getting started in 1864. 1874, it crossed over the northwestern tracks and, by the way, had a, a little line that, that took it in to what became a Union Station. Okay, which used to be right to the south or to the west of Duff on the south side of the railroad tracks. There was the established Northwestern Station, and that little narrow gauge would come in there and share the station with the big mm -hmm. railroad, so to speak. And just to, divert, to head back a little bit further, that station stayed in Ames until the 1980s. It became a freight house. It got covered with with a 
uh, corrugated metal. I think a lot of people just didn't think about it anymore as being the original station. But when that station ultimately got torn down, they took all the metal off. And there was the original timbers of the station, which I remember going down there and being amazed at how that was built. I mean, it could have stayed there the for ages. another hundred years. It was amazing, these timbers. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this little railroad came through and then eventually became part of the Northwestern. Just a, another little quick story. It, people familiar with Northwestern Avenue. That used to be the narrow gauge because it came across and you might notice that it kind of parallels yes. what's now the, the line that goes north. Yes. Okay, when Northwestern bought that line, it, it needed to get a bigger sweep to, to turn the main line to go north, which meant they had to, to move the tracks a little to the west. And so then that line became what is Northwestern Avenue, which parallels that. Okay, so that <laughs> Northwestern bought that, and just to, that then line went up to Eagle Grove and points north, and then it went south to Des Moines. So again, the intersection was important because not only you had east west, but you had north south. It, yes, crossroads, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talked about the depot, and um, you need to tell me a little bit about your motivations for depot at dawn. Well, <laughs> obviously it goes back to my dad and his stories and the glory days, but that's uh, a steam locomotive, which was his favorite. It was a 484 Class H, but he'd always, Stew, those are big steam locomotives. And they were, they're huge behemoths. They called them uh, mm -hmm. Zeppelins on, mm -hmm. on rails. But that, that's at the head end of this train. It's a westbound train. I snuck into a, a person with this letter jacket there, which, which, by the way, is standing next to it. Earlier I talked about the subway, but you, it, you can see that he's leaning up against the railing that went down underneath. But just one of them, that would be one of the many trains that came through Ames. That's kind of in, in the 1940s. Um, how about, I think you have one about Christmas Eve. I do. And you talked a little bit I about Christmas Eve. I did talk Eve. about that. So that... Well, again, that just goes back to the story of what it was like standing there watching this amazing train come in. Uh, and that's it, largely fueled by your dad's oh, um, and That's all about my dad's. Yeah. Uh, both, both those really are just, that's dad's stories. Kind of going back to what I said, crystallizing the movie. Mm -hmm. It's taking that experience that he told me and, and putting it into visual form. Your detail is amazing. It's just amazing for so many of those things that around the depot, the, the paintings that you've done. And I think you told me something about counting bricks. <laughs> I did. There's another piece that I did, which was the westbound yes. challenger that's a <laughs> pencil drawing. Yes. Uh, and that, again, is the specific one that affected me. The steam one is more my dad's story. Right. The challenger is the, cha the 217 arrival of the challenger. Which, I don't know, for some reason forever I've been intrigued with, with uh, details, as you say. I, I go back to my early drawings. I just, I had such an interest in it that that just manifested in, well, I have interest, so I want to study all those little nuts and bolts and all that type of thing. But historically, but, it's accurate. Yeah, I mean, well, the things I, that you're putting it, in the pictures. Whatever I can, since the Ames Depot was there, and I'm drawing the Ames Depot, I went down there doing sketches, and yes, you are correct, I counted the number of bricks on the chimney. <laughs> that might have been taken a little bit too far, but, <laughs> but I do like to try to keep it historically accurate. Mm -hmm. And I think these are somewhat remated, re linked to Ames, the Falcon. Yes. Now that, I mentioned earlier, the Minnesota Avenue overpass, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was my favorite place to go watch trains. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of those little stories, kind of like the bus of having independence of a bicycle and getting on my bicycle and going down Oakland Hill, which is a big hill, and then going up Highland Hill, which wasn't so much fun, but then taking my bike out to, to the bridge. And essentially, those were the days when Mom would just kind of say, hey, we'll see you for dinner, and off you go, and, and watching trains. And there's... A quick little story about Dad. That was his favorite place to go. His grandma, or my grandmother, would take him out there, because it was the, the trains would be heading up out of the Skunk River Valley, and 
hitting, hitting the, the, the hill at, at the point where they go underneath the bridge, but he would describe how these trains would, would be coming with these belching, just these big pillars of steam up in the sky, and they'd get under the bridge, and just like the light kind of got snuffed out, the, the smoke would be underneath the bridge, and then as the train came beyond it, it would just blast up, and you'd get this whole shower of soot and cinders coming down, which for a little boy is like, this is cool stuff. But that, but that has always had special meaning to me, the, that location. And the Falcon train was in the 70s and 80s, the Northwestern Railroad, really kind of, when I'm a little boy riding my, my bicycle out there, the Northwestern Railroad was having hard times as railroads kind of all over the place. And during a day, there would be less than 10 trains, at, at times like six trains a day. So as a kid, it was, it was a big deal when a train came. Mm-hmm. And not like today where we're seeing 60 trains. We've seen up to almost 100, 90, 95 trains. It's kind of hard now to think in terms of at one time there weren't a lot of trains. But in the 70s, the, the Northwestern Railroad was trying to get things back in order. And one of the things they were working on was a piggyback service, which would be taking truck trailers and putting them on flat cars and taking that off the roads. And they had a very efficient service called the Falcon Trains that ran Mm -hmm. between Chicago and Fremont, Nebraska, where they handed the trains over to the Union Pacific like they did back in the old days with the passenger trains. Um, But a very fast-moving freight. And it was really, it had taken the pride of what passenger service was like and was pumping it back into these fast, frequent uh, freight trains. I always give people an opportunity at the end of a conversation to remark about something. Perhaps I've not asked a question that uh, you would like to give me an answer to, (laughs) um, or that you may have a thought that's occurred to you as we've had this conversation and that you'd like to um, express that. So, Stu, are there any other thoughts about your experience at Ames, your relationships to trains, and Ames' relationships to trains that... um, like to tell me about that I forgot to ask I don't you. think so other than hopefully that this discussion might give people some perspective on where trains have been and where they're going and maybe next time when they stop at a crossing gate instead of <laughs> cursing it they can say hmm <laughs> that's pretty interesting yeah um, on your website um, you had said that an artist should have a resonance or a spiritual connection with a subject. I think you have that hands down. Hopefully that's come across. <laughs> I think you have. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with me today, Stu. It has I really, been an absolute pleasure. Thank I you. really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>